Hello folks and welcome to another SACPA session. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis nations of Alberta Region 3. And we pay respect to their past, present and future cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. SACPA is committed to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. SACPA is very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight and the Lethbridge Herald. Today we welcome our speaker Nara Fedozi on the subject of domestic abuse, a shift in, the, in perspective. Nara is a registered social worker and an extensive background in community services and program development. She's very passionate about social justice, advocacy and challenging stereotypes. Nara is originally from Brazil, where she started her career. She has over 15 years of progressive experience in various areas such as government, heal and heal and nonprofit se settings with the last several years focusing on housing and social services supports. In Canada, Nara was able to expand her experience in the domestic violence sector, having worked for many years with, individual, with individuals experiencing domestic abuse and violence. Nara was thrilled to assume the role of program director with the Safe at Home program in June of 2021. Nara believes that this initiative, uh, Nara believes that this innovative program will advance the work around supporting individuals, families and communities in making positive changes that will help break the cycle of domestic abuse and violence. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nara, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Annalise. And thank you so much, everybody who has joined us today. We are excited. I'm very excited to be here and talking about this so important topic. Um, so I, I want to introduce you a little bit of Safe at Home, what the program is and how we can support in this area of domestic abuse and just have a, a general discussion about domestic abuse in general. There's a lot of stigma and, and myths about this topic. So really hoping to, to continue this conversation, trying to normalize this topic so more people can feel safe, reaching out to supports and, and heal uh, from, from this um, towards a positive change. All right, uh, can we move to the second slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so here, I just wanna talk a little bit about Rowan House. Uh, so Safe at Home is one of the programs led by Rowan House. Uh, Rowan House uh, actually provides, it's, it's a larger organization that provides uh, a range of services and supports uh, to individuals who are experiencing domestic abuse and violence. Uh, so with that being said, we have different programs under the umbrella. Uh, so we provide short-term emergency shelter for women and children. We also pro provide outreach uh, to those fleeing domestic abuse um, or experiencing domestic abuse. There is a, a department also that with primarily with schools and community-based uh, and general public as well in terms of awareness of the issue. Um, understanding what abuse is, understanding domestic, uh, domestic violence as a whole, and how it impacts individuals, families, and communities. Um, and we have Safe at Home that I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. Uh, so can you can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so before we start talking about Safe at Home, we wanted to talk about uh, domestic abuse issue here in Canada. Uh, so here, I just included some stats for you. So in Canada, women are killed by a partner on average every six days. Um, Canadians spend uh, 7.4 billion a year to deal with the uh, with the issue of domestic abuse. That includes emergency services, that includes shelters, that include a range of services in this area. And uh, important to know that the stats they are usually back. A couple of years, uh, so the numbers actually might be higher at this point. Uh, 
so the last stat that I have here, actually, those are reports to RCMP within the Southern Alberta. So within the rural area here. So a lot of folks think actually that we don't experience domestic violence or it's not that big of a deal. So here, those stats show us that actually over two, uh, 2,400 cases were reported related to domestic violence to RCMP. So within the rural area in Alberta. And that's only six months last year. So we, we are looking at those numbers since March 2021, when actually Safe at Home opened its doors. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of uh, an overview in terms of how the problem is out there. Uh, and a lot of the, the this number actually is probably way higher because a lot of people do not report domestic abuse for various reasons. Uh, sometimes it can be related to uh, their shame. They don't want to disclose personal matters, uh, afraid of how, how the community is going to see them and how they, how they are going to be treated, if they're going to be believed, um, if that's going to increase actually the risk, if they are going to have access to resources, all those kind of things. It's, uh, again, it goes back to the, uh, the need for us to normalize the conversation so we can talk about resources, we can talk about prevention, and we can talk about early intervention as well. Uh, next slide, please. So you can talk a little bit about safe at home. So safe at home, for those of you who don't know, uh, don't know, it's a four-year pilot project. It's funded by the federal government by wage, so women and gender equality. And the the hope of this program is to end the cycle of abuse. The way we do that, though, is it's innovative. It's different from it's it. The program actually is the first of its, its kind in a rural community in Canada. At the end of this pilot project, which uh, we are looking at mid next year, um, we are committed to, to our funder to produce um, blueprint. So we are going to be documenting all learnings, recommendation, everything that worked really well, everything that could be improved upon. Uh, so other organizations across Canada actually can refer to this document as a guiding tool. So if they are looking to uh, implement something similar in their area, within their organization, they can refer to that, uh, which is really cool. Uh, so. The way we are designed to end domestic, the way the program is designed to end domestic violence that we commit to do that is that instead of providing services to one part of the family, one individual specifically, we are trying to address the issue through a holistic approach. So while Safe at Home is providing, we, we provide a range of services and supports to the individual with, with individuals with a history of perpetrating abuse, um, abuse, abusive partners towards their intimate partner. We work collaboratively with the outreach team through Rowan House, who is actually supporting the impacted family through this process. So through Safe at Home, we provide psychosocial edu psycho education uh, sessions, either in group or individual. We provide case management. We also provide transitional housing. And that gives an opportunity for the person who has actually been impacted by the abuse to stay safe at home. Um, and with minimal interruptions um, or less interruptions to that day-to-day -day, uh, life. So they can still keep uh, be close to their informal and formal social supports. Uh, kids can still attend school um, while they are also receiving supports through the outreach team. So clients who come to our program, they are actually required to sign a document where they are giving the information for their partner. Uh, and we share the information with uh, the outreach team and they are reaching out to them to make sure that they are doing safety checks, make sure that the family remains safe uh, and providing a range of services and support throughout their, their, um, their engagement within the program. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Why did we decide about this approach? Uh, so we think that uh, emergency shelters, counseling services, all those services that are out there already, they are amazing. They are critical services and they are going to remain to be important throughout the cycle. 
uh, while we are trying to, to end domestic abuse. However, when we are providing services um, through shelter, we need to think that shelters, people accessing shelters, uh, usually when they reach out to, that, to services at that point, the abuse has been occurring for quite some time. So it has increased, uh, not just in terms of risk, but also in terms of how many, how many incidents have been happening. And uh, so we, again, we are trying to shift the perspective so we can do a more proactive and early intervention. Uh, the other thing is when you're providing shelters for folks who are fleeing domestic violence, who are, who, who are being abused, we are not addressing the root cause of the problem. And that's the key part of this program. Uh, so we, we know through research uh, that folks who actually are perpetrating abuse, there is oftentimes there is um, a connection to, to intergenerational trauma. So it, the, the abuse is kind of normalized within their lives. So a lot of clients who come to our program, they actually don't even see uh, the extent of the problem. And a lot of people who don't reach out to services, they don't even recognize there is a problem there. So you see, I also quote from Lucky Pete he says, domestic abuse is a frustration problem, not a relationship problem. So it's it's an abusive it's an abusive behavior that has been learned. So if it has been learned, as long as the person is willing to change, they have a notion there is a problem there and they're willing to accept help, this can change. Uh, so that's the focus of the program. So we are providing a range of supports where those individuals actually can understand how did this, how did this happen? Um, how did I get here? And how can I move forward? What are some of the tools and skills that I can actually learn? Uh, to make a positive change for myself and for my family. Uh, in a lot of cases, actually, clients come to our program and they are hoping to go back to their family. In some other cases, they are moving on um, as well. So we work with people where they're at. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So here, um, uh, talking about how people got here, like how did they start perpetrating abuse? Uh, so it's important to, again, to talk about that, uh, uh, the intergenerational trauma. So I'm not saying, not saying in any ways that abuse is okay. It there is any kind of justification for abuse. Uh, talking about how behavior can be impacted by over time experiencing trauma. So if, if, if we talk with our clients who come to our program, oftentimes we are gonna hear, actually, all this has been part of my whole life. I have witnessed this happening with somebody very close to them, or they have been victims themselves. Um, and again, not all victims of abuse, not all people who have experienced trauma will end up abusing their intimate partner, but that actually put them in higher risk to perpetrating abuse. And that's a fact that we need to take into account. Uh, so oftentimes we, we are working collaboratively with organizations out there who provide different sort, sort of services, including uh, emotional supports, mental health supports, because they are all interconnected most of the time. Um, so it's also about uh, control power and control uh, towards their intimate partner. So a lot of people think that there is, I, I'm losing my control. Even clients who come to our program, it was, you know, it was in the heat of the emotion there and I lost my control. But why, what are some of the triggers? What brought you here? How did you get here? And how can we support you gaining some of the tools, uh, communication, talking about the power and control, uh, and a lot of people think about um, also different kinds of program and, and anger management program as well uh, when we talk domestic abuse. Uh, and anger management, it's, it's really for folks who are um, losing control and they really need to, to learn some skills on how to control themselves towards everybody. 
so when we talk about intimate partner relationship abuse, um, it is different. So the domestic violence programs, they also take into account the safety of the partner uh, and also focus on that specific relationship uh, dynamics as well. So it usually happens behind doors. Uh, so a person who maybe uh, look like to you very social, very pleasant, um, any gender, any class, it can be perpetrated by anybody at all. And really, um, there are lots of myths about this. There is poor communication. A person can be really well spoken. So those are some, some of the things that we really need to take into account when you are referring people to programs as well. Nara, um, Nara. Can I just yes. can I just interject for a minute? When you turn your head to the side, we lose the mic. We lose your voice. Okay. Thank you. Sounds, yeah. sounds good. Thank you. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so here, just talking again about some of the myths that we, we started talking about in the previous slide. So talking about loss of control. It's actually about gaining control and power over your intimate partner. So those are some of the skills and so, some of the learnings that we are going to cover in our in our program. Uh, so uh, other thing that we hear quite often, he's not that sort of man. Um, and again, so it can be somebody really close to you that you have no idea about and can present really pleasant and really sociable. Can be someone who is very involved in community programs, community. Uh, events, those kind of things. Um, and um, what else? Um, poor communication. Uh, sometimes it can be somebody really well spoken with a really, really high um, um, be involved in even giving presentations and trainings in community. Um, it's a relationship issue. It's not a relationship issue. It's a perpetration issue. It's again about that power and control. Um, it's it's related to alcohol and drugs. So not everybody who has uh, addictions issues would perpetrate abuse. It puts them in a higher risk though uh, when they are um, uh, consuming alcohol or drugs if they have that problem, but it's not a cause. Uh, next slide, please. So just talking about the contrib contributing factors here. So again, talking about the mental health and addictions piece. Uh, again, so those are not causes for the problem. They are contributing. They can amplify the issue. Uh, so lack of consequences as well. So a lot of times people perpetrating abuse, there is no consequences to that. And so they keep doing because it's normal. Right, so nothing happens. Uh, so I don't even think that this is a problem. Um, and victim blaming. So it, this is a reaction to whatever my partner did to me. So I'm just, you know, uh, being caught up by the heat of the moment, which uh, again is about gaining that control and exercising the power uh, over your arrangement partner. Uh, so in our program, we talk a lot about accountability through the different phases of our program. Uh, so again, there is no justification, there is, there is no excuse for abuse. Uh, so it's really learning uh, where, how did you get here? And so you can see some of the triggers and you can, you can self learn some of the skills to self-intervene and end the cycle of abuse. Uh, and really talking about the education portion as well which is really critical. Again, so talking about really normalizing the conversation about abuse so people can feel it's a very safe space for me to be able to share my experiences without being judged, without being uh, fitting to a, a certain box. So e each individual is unique. There is a specific needs and strengths. Uh, so, and the focus of our program is really working with each individual uh, and meeting them where they're at and creating those safe spaces for those conversations. Next one, please. Uh, so who are our clients? Uh, so we, we provide services for men with a history of perpetrating abuse. The reason, it, I, I just wanted to clarify, so we talk a little bit about abuse can be perpetrated by anybody, all genders included. Uh, 
uh, any class, any race. So the reason I wanted to address this here for a minute. So the reason why we, prov uh, we provide this program for men is uh, if you look at the statistics, it's predominantly uh, perpetrated by males at this point. So we, we keep tracking our numbers, we keep tracking referrals, we keep tracking cases. Uh, in future, we may change this, but uh, right now we can only we are only funded to provide this service for male uh, with a history of perpetrating abuse towards their intimate partner who are 18 plus. Some cases are, uh, we have referrals from uh, RCMP, from police, uh, prosecutors, uh, crown prosecutors, from judges. Uh, in some cases, we are talking about the early intervention and prevention. Some cases, actually, clients are self-referring themselves. They really want to make that positive change and and uh, be better for future relationships or, again, to, to make a positive change and go back to their families. So a lot of the clients actually who come to our program, they have learned through their partner who are uh, who have heard about us through through different organizations in community as well. Um, yes. So yeah, so the main the main thing is that they are they have a notion there is there is a problem there and they are willing to accept help and make that positive change towards healthier healthier relationships. Uh, next one, please. So just talking about uh, here again, so 18 plus men with a history of uh, abuse, abusive partner patterns towards their intimate partner. Uh, so if there is any history of physical or mental health, uh, we do have some screenings uh, that we do during the intake process. And the reason we do that is not to screen people out of our programming anyway. It's just that uh, we want to make sure that people are stable enough to engage in our program in a meaningful way. So if you feel during the intake process that the person, uh, uh, the person's needs exceed the services that we do provide in our program, we can make recommendation about alternate services where they can access uh, prior to coming to our program. Uh, we can support in that system navigation and uh, the referral process for them to those alternate programs. We are connected with a range of services, amazing services in community. We are not looking to duplicate work at all. We are looking to work collaboratively to, uh, to achieve the best outcome. Uh, we are an alcohol and drugs free environment in our transitional housing portion. Uh, so also important to know, so, um, it, so not everybody would, would feel um, ready to commit to that portion. Uh, so this is something that, again, so if, if this is a need uh, that the client has, that they cannot be abstinent between, uh, within that phase of the program, we can talk to them about alternate uh, services in community as well. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Okay, how it works. I think I talked a little bit about this. So we work in collaboration with outreach programs. So we are looking at the he healing of the whole family. Why are we uh, through Safe at Home are providing those services to the men with a history of perpetrating abuse? Uh, Safe at Home, uh, Rowan House, sorry, is working with that, uh, the impacted family. So they, they do the safety checks with them. Uh, also, they provide a range of services, including case management, so whatever the needs might be. So uh, if the person needs to apply for an EPO, emergency protection order, they will work with them on that regards. If they are looking for legal resources, they are going to be working with, with them on that regards. Uh, if they are looking for housing, if they are going... Um, going apart. So that's something actually that they can look into as well. So uh, again, as I said, so a lot of people have a lot of trauma over time and uh, they may require emotional support. This is something that outreach team would be looking to physical health, life skills, all those kind of things that the outreach can work with them. Also uh, services and supports for the children too. And next one, please. 
we in safe at home we have three different phases so the phase one uh it's a minimum of four four weeks uh and we cover eight modules at that time uh for the psychoeducation session so again we co we focus a lot on that taking accountability, taking responsibility for the unhealthy behavior, the abusive patterns, so they can really learn how did they get there and really start learning some skills to self-intervene and move uh, forward uh, towards health, healthier uh, behavior that way. So we talk a little bit about the cycle of abuse, what is abuse, so they can recognize a lot of the signs and symptoms, uh, the signs around this. Um, and um, again, a lot of clients come to our program and I never, I never thought about this this way. I never thought this was actually abuse. It's interesting because I have experienced this. This is a normal part of my life, my whole life. So, uh, and talking about how that impacts themselves and how they impact the dynamics within the family as well. Um, and what else? So we also offer on top of the psychoeducation sessions there, we also offer the case management. So similar to what, what I was talking about, uh, the service outreach team provides to the impacted family. So it will be similar. So all those life skills, uh, a lot of the men come to the house, they may not know how to cook, how to clean, how to do groceries, those kind of things that might be something that we can explore with them. It's really individual basis and uh, based on the individual needs of each client and its strengths base as well. Um, so we have the case measurement portion at that phase once a week and the, the program is uh, once or twice a week, depending on how long they are gonna stay with us. If they are looking towards housing, securing long-term or permanent housing, we can also extend their stay as long as they are committed uh, to, to our program, they're really engaged, we can extend their stay with us as well uh, until they, they secure the housing portion. Uh, so at that phase, the men are coming and staying with us in our transitional housing. On phase two of our program, we cover 10 modules uh, and it's, it's, it's once a week. And we continue to provide that case management portion so some of the topics that we cover in phase two, um, when people graduate from phase one, they enter into that phase two, which I want to say it's an online portion of our program. But if people don't have are not technology savvy, or if they don't feel comfortable with technology, they can still come once a week to our house, and uh, we are trying to minimize barriers as much as possible and be inclusive that way. Uh, so we talk about healthy and unhealthy relationships, um, behavior, I mean, so intensity and independency, respect versus loyalty, control ver versus equity, um, equality, isolation versus trust, obsession. We talk about, again, guilt and take versus taking responsibility. Uh, and we also talk about anger versus communication. So just building some of those skills forward that uh, healthier behavior. And the phase three of our program, the total of our program, it's up to a year, up to 52 weeks. So it's that aftercare. So we continue to provide that case management, do that follow-up. And uh, so we have the psychoeducation portion. So it's once a month that we do that. And really we are looking at reflecting some of the, the skills that they have acquired through all the different phases of our program and talking to them how how is that applicable how is that working is that working well with you and uh, clients can also um, work in a more peer support in the phase as well so they can give advice so this is really how how it's working for me so you can try different techniques that we have learned throughout the program so it's really cool uh to see that resiliency and that collaboration between clients at that point as well and really uh really rewarding to see when clients come and uh there is that aha moment oh i never thought about this i never thought i was hurting this person that i love so much uh, in, in any way so it's important to think nobody uh, wakes up and uh, oh, we really wanna really wanna hurt my partner. Uh, so there is no pleasure with this. It's really 
uh, learning those behavior, learning some tools uh, towards that positive change. Uh, next point, please. Thank you. Okay, it's not changing here for me. Okay, so the services, we talk a little bit about that case management portion. So we, we are solution focused. We have that solution focused approach. We offer a safe space where people can come and they can talk, they can share their experiences. Uh, we are not here to judge. We are here to, to work with you towards that uh, positive change for you and, and for families and, and communities so we can start the healing process. Uh, so we can provide referrals, advocacy, system navigation, all those kind of things, whatever your needs are, we are going to be meeting you where you're at. Uh, so if you are not aware, uh, if you're unsure, if, if you are struggling with abusive partner patterns within your relationship, you can also give us a call. We can, we can talk a little bit about this when we can talk about uh, whether or not the program is it's a good fit for you. And if not, also discuss some, some alternate resources for you that way. Uh, and next slide, please, which is the last slide uh, and just the contact information. This is how you can find us. Uh, so first one, it's uh, my name there, my contact information. Again, I am Nara Fedosi, the program director for State at Home. Uh, I have here my email and my contact number, my cell phone. Happy to have a, a touch, uh, touch base with you anytime. Uh, also the contact information for, for the team, the amazing team. Uh, so it's the best way to contact us through that uh, phone number and the email. So we always have somebody monitoring that they are taking turns. And we are also we also have here our website and our social media. Uh, in our social media, we are always always posting things that are related to the issue. Uh, so you're going to see also some education series. So you're going to be uh, putting there different topics uh, from things that people are curious about. Some of it's really based on Oh, frequent questions that we have. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we are going to be posting more and more things there and hope, hope to, to see you there too. Wonderful, Nara. It's really great to hear a program such as this um, that actually deals with the problem and not just, you know, with the crisis, right? Because often it's just pure crisis intervention. And, and the safety of the person being abused. And it's really great to hear that there's a program out there that actually deals with the issue. Um, good for you for setting that up. We have quite a few questions in the queue. I'll start out with Mark Goodall. Do you deal only with physical abuse or are some of your clients because of psychological abuse? Yes, any any kind of abuse, not just the physical. And I'm so glad that you asked this question because a lot of people actually tend, tend to think that uh, abuse is only physical or only sexual. And there is many kinds of abuse. And we did we we talk a little bit about this in our social media. We do have posts in there where and in our website as well that talk about the different kinds of abuse. Just a little bit of an introduction to this topic. It's so broad. So this is something that we cover in length in our programming as well. So any kind of abuse, really. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Many thanks for your presentation, Nora. Have you so far seen substantial evidence that abusive behavior tends to subside following psychoeducation? I think uh, we are really early stages of this program. So we are monitoring data. Uh, what I can say is that we are receiving a lot of great feedback and we are seeing positive changes uh, through the participation of individuals in this program. So it's really excited to see. Uh, it's really critical to say though, we don't work by on a silo, we work with a lot of community supports available out there. So as I said, so a lot of people have uh, have a need for emotional support, mental health support. So we connect them with the right supports and that connection really, uh, all, all those kind of supports um, 
addictions in some cases. In some other cases, people haven't seen um, a family doctor for quite some while, quite some time, and that may be even impacting with you know um, increasing the anxiety levels and how they behave as well. Um, and again, no justifying abuse in any ways, but amplifying factors. Uh, not having income, which has been increased so much within the pandemic, not losing their job, all those kind of things that we work through the case management perspective and connecting them with the right resources at the right time, that's the critical piece. So it's, it, it takes a village. Uh, but uh, willingness, willingness to change, uh, that's the first step, like recognizing there is a problem and seeking out for help. Those are the first steps uh, towards that positive change. Our next question comes from Lori Schultz. Thanks, Nara, for your informative presentation. What was the process to apply for this pilot project? What were the criteria? Did the geographical area of Southern Alberta play a role in the, in the selection? i.e. is the domestic violence stats playing a role in choosing Southern Alberta as the pilot pro as the pilot project? Uh, so I wasn't part of the program yet when we applied when Rowan House applied for this funding specifically. Um, I, when I learned about the program and I learned about my current position, I was so excited. I was like, I need to be part of this project. <laughs> So excited, so innovative, and and so long, long due, to be quite honest. Uh, that's what I thought. Uh, so I got really excited. So what I can tell you is that yes, it is a big issue with rural communities. Although we we don't talk a lot, it's not normalized yet. So there is lots of room for improvement in these regards, uh, and we also can see uh, a lack of resources in rural communities. And if there is a case where people need to, to go to shelters, uh, there is a lot of times that it's, it's, there is some delays uh, within the process. Uh, it's not as accessible in rural areas. Uh, so there is a lot of things that you need to take into account. Also, uh, the barriers to accessing services, not just the transportation aspect, uh, which kind of increases the risk as well for the person who is trying to leave. A lot of people decide not to leave for various reasons, which actually is the most dangerous uh, part of, uh, of um, an abusive situation when the person actually decides to leave. So that also needs to take into account. So um, yes, so basically the, the barriers and the limits, uh, geographic um, barriers also, and whole accessibility in terms of technology and accessing services in general that did play a big role in that uh, application being successful. Our next question is from uh, Leona Jacobs. I may be missed. I think she means I may have missed this, but what motivates the abuser to leave the home as opposed to the victim leaving out of necessity and for safety reasons? What motivates then? Um, I think there is different things that would motivate different people. So I get I, I don't think I will have an answer that will fit it all. <laughs> uh, but I I mean a lot of clients who came to our program, they 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 initiated the conversation at home. So it was it was really seeing how whatever behavior they, they were having towards their intimate partner was impacting the whole family. And for a lot of people was like, that's that's my last try. I really want to make this relationship uh, successful. I really want to change for my family, for my partner, for for my children. For my children is a big one. Um, and again, so a lot of times they come to the program and they 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 have a sense there is a problem there, but they are not uh, sure about the extent of the problem and the extent how they are being they are hurting the family and how they are hurting themselves. Uh, so when we are talking about the different dynamics, the different tools about communication, effective communication, they start applying this uh, when they go back to their relationships or they move towards the new relationship and they kind of see 
wow, I never really, I never thought about this. And I never actually thought about this impacting me in my previous experiences or, you know, somebody that was really close to that. I, I witnessed my mom going through this and I never thought this was actually abuse. So another question was, do, do you deal only with the physical abuse? There are so many, there is the emotional, there is the spiritual, uh, there is the financial abuse. There is so many aspects to this and people tend not to even think about those things. Do you also get referrals just to, um um expand out on this question do you get court orders we do uh as long as the client is um accepting there is a problem and they're willing to accept help we can work with them the other thing that it's important for me to clarify here uh the way we are staffed and also it's a com uh it's a communal living space that we have clients have access to a private bedroom but everything else is a uh, a shared space within the house with that being said the staffing model we we have is staffing the house for 13 hours a day so it's not 24 7. Uh, so we have an on-call system, we have a security system, but with that being said, we can only support clients in our transitional housing at this point who are low to moderate risk. Uh, so when we are doing our assessments, one of them is to assess the level of risk. If a client uh, is deemed to be high risk, uh, they cannot come to our transitional housing. We do have an online version of our program, which is only 10 weeks. Uh, and it doesn't include the case management portion, but the psychoeducation piece. Uh, and we can support them accessing other services that provide the housing portion, such as John Howard Society, for example. And when you talk about high risk, are you talking about high risk of uh, not succeeding in the program or high risk in terms of violence that might be perpetrated towards their partner? Uh, in terms of violence, so I, I, I know, so when you, when you think about community and you think about services in the community, there is a sense that if we do have a program like this in our community, are we increasing the risk in this community, in this particular community? So two things to think about when we are discussing this. So first is we only work uh, in our transitional housing with low to moderate risk. The other thing is uh, the the abuse, it is happening. As, as we are talking about stats, it is happening out there. So we can uh, move towards uh, the early intervention prevention, uh, or we if we close our eyes to the problem, we are actually increasing the risk because we are addressing the root cause. The other thing is uh, for us to consider is that often the when when we're talking about domestic abuse, the abuse is really focused and towards the intimate partner. Usually it's not a risk to the community. So when we talk about risk in terms of the programming portion, we are talking about risk to the other clients and to staff, how we handle that. Uh, so we assess the risk that way as well. Okay. Um... Our next question comes from Beth Mundell. Thanks, Nara. Is research being conducted on the clients through the, uni through the university or college or a university or college? Uh, I know there is quite a few uh, researchers happening. I know there is, uh, there is one through the University of Calgary. Of Calgary. Uh, we have been in touch with them. They're uh, talking uh, with uh, folks involved in domestic violence incidents, uh, experiencing domestic violence or perpetrating abuse. Uh, there is some other research happening Canada-wise. There's quite a few. There's quite a few out there. So it's, it's good to see. Great. Um, Leona jo Jacobs, Harbor House has had to reduce its capacity as a shelter due to COVID. What has been the impacts of COVID on your program? Uh, let me think about it. Um, in some cases, I think uh, some people might feel, um, might feel more comfortable attending online programs uh, rather than um, in-house programs because of COVID. 
uh, we haven't reduced capacity in our program. So our program is operating. We do have vacancies. So if anybody is interested, give us a call. Uh, we are happy to talk to you. Um, and the other thing that I want to uh, talk about here is it's it's important for folks to to know that we do have our COVID protocols in place. So if if we do have a client, well, first of all, so all our staff are required to be vaccinated. Uh, so that's a safety measurement that the whole row and house organization has taken to protect clients. Uh, and staff members as well. Uh, the other thing, we have a whole COVID protocol. If a client tests positive, again, so we are communal leaving. So uh, if we need to isolate a client, we have a partnership with a hotel in the city uh, who also follows a very strict uh, guidelines in terms of COVID to protect the clients and to, provide, to, to protect the staff as well. Uh, so, uh, we have a very strict protocol in place uh, and we are very committed to the safety of our clients and staff as well. So just, just to let you know. <laughs> um, so our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. Over 50 years, there has been a major improvement in girls' education, increasing occupational scope. My concern has been boys' schooling has not adapted, leaving them behind and setting up a conflict. So I think this is pretty off topic, but I don't know if you'd like to answer or not. Uh, yes, addressing conflict. <laughs> uh, so what can I say about this? I think it goes back to the prevention piece and the importance of normalizing conversation and, you know, um, and, and creating those safe spaces for folks. Um, right. So it is, I, I think that it's a big topic. I think it's a whole conversation, a whole presentation that we need to look into. But again, I, again, I, I hear you. And I think it goes back to, to the prevention piece and normalizing the conversation. Um, which is critical. Our next question comes from Laura Schultz. Is Safe at Home collaborating with Domestic Violence Family Court as well as Child Protection Services? Yes, we are. Um, and enhancing our relationship with, with the legal system as well. Um, so yes, we are connected with Child and Family Services, with police, with RCMP, with court prosecutors. Um, we actually, we have had a few, well, just so you know, we, we have participated in podcasting the past with Rowan House as well. Uh, so if you wanna, if you wanna take a listen, uh, just visit our website, uh, in, in our social media, you can see a few. Uh, so we are gonna actually have a judge joining us uh, in that discussion about domestic violence in March. Uh, so I'm very excited about this. So uh, just, just having that broader discussion about how the legal system works in cases of domestic abuse uh, and really focusing on that restorative justice approach. Uh, so on the importance of programs like this and, and, and the benefits that it, it has on families and on the individuals rather than the, um, only the punitive approach. Right, so the education piece, the prevention piece, the early intervention, really all those, all those supports in place. So people can really have a chance to make a positive change. Hmm. I guess that also goes both ways. Do you provide education to the RCMP, to the judges, judge and court system in terms of domestic abuse? Because we, we've seen quite often how the subject isn't really fully understood. Absolutely. So we have been in community out and about talking about this issue and about changing those perspectives and, and talking about how, how abuse impacts people. And uh, we are also having con conversations with, with key partners in community and how, how might we uh, increase opportunities in terms of education for folks who are 
um, part of the legal system for professionals, really. Uh, so how to how to address this? So it's it's on the works. Stay tuned. Lots of exciting things coming. Excellent. Our next question comes from uh, Bab Mundell. Do your clients continue to go to work while in residence? Does anyone monitor their behavior in the residence, i.e. bullying, emotional abuse to others so that they can work on those issues? Uh, so when you say monitoring the behaviors while they are in the house, uh, so if, if we do have protocols, if there is any incidents and how to address those incidents while they're in the house, uh, we don't monitor when they are out in community. So if we do have reports and, and we also, um, in, so if as part of our intake process, we do ask if they have any any legal charges, any legal involvement, all those kind of things. And if there is, we 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 usually have release of information in place. So we are collaborating with those external partners. So again, just going back to the safety uh, perspective, ensuring the safety of the entire family. So we do have protocols in place to to monitor and and to support uh, that client to in intervene. Um, in terms of incidents in the house, uh, we do have policies, procedures that we follow as well to protect the safety of staff and safety of our other clients as well. It's not common that we have those things. Again, so when you're talking about domestic abuse, usually the, it's that power and control uh, that we are talking about and really focus uh, on the intimate partner. And I think the first part of the question was, um, do the clients continue to go to work? Oh, yes. Sorry, I, for, I, I missed that part. Yes, it, it is open. So some clients, uh, we have had clients in the house that were commuting back, back and forth during the day. They can go out, they can go to work. Uh, so clients with, with children, uh, we can also facilitate a visitation in our, in our site if that's something that they are looking to, uh, so it's safe. It's safe to do so. Uh, we are mindful of uh, no contact order orders as well. So we work with partners if if there is legal system involvement. We definitely take that into account. Uh, so in that case, we would follow whatever the guidelines are. Um, but yeah, so it's it's not a locked facility. They can go and uh, they can go and come back. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Financial distress often plays into abusive situations. Are you able to facilitate monetary help for, from government sources? Absolutely. That's something that we support clients with during, uh, through our case management uh, services. Yes, that, that's one part of the services that we provide. Leona Jacobs, there is or was a local initiative called the Domestic Violence Action Team, which ran, in brackets at one time, abuser intervention programs. Is your program related to this in some way? DART, uh, yes, so it's called DART. We, we have been in communication with them and looking for ways to enhance collaboration. So DART, primarily they, uh, provide a range of services and uh, there is a few organizations that are part of this initiative and it's amazing. They are doing amazing work uh, looking at prevention and looking at early intervention and supports for folks who are uh, impacted by uh, family violence. Uh, with that being said, uh, really talking uh, about ways, as I said, a lot of the referrals that come, a lot of self referrals that come to our program uh, that has been initiated by conversations at home. So they have learned about the program through the partner. So really looking into ways to enhance that, uh, the word out there uh, through, through different programs. So we are connected with DART and uh, we are actually arranging a lunch and learn for all, all agencies, all, all, all who are players within this initiative. So they all are all aware about the program and they, they can discuss that with clients as well, potential clients. Great. Um, 
A follow-up question by Beth Mundell, who asked about research earlier in universities. Um, she's saying, I meant to ask if research is being conducted on the efficacy of your transition program by a university. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yes, there is one in one research happening in, I believe it's in Ottawa. Uh, that is is not specific about our program safe at home, but it's it's they are researching initiatives similar to this, including safe at home. Uh, so really really cool the work that they are doing, and the research that I was referring to through the University of Calgary, it's called uh, Shift, and they're really looking at different not not specifically about safe at home and similar projects, but they are looking at alternate alternative ways to end domestic violence, which includes programs like this. So yes, there is research is happening out there. Really exciting. Excellent. I'm glad you clarified that, Beth. Um, Laura Schultz, you may have spoken about this, but when a client enters this program, is your outreach team working with the spouse and children? And if the client returns to the spouse and family, what family aftercare is provided? Yes. So yes, the outreach team works with the impacted family. So it's with the partner and children, if there is children involved. Um, and yes, while the client, so we, the duration of the safe home program is up to one year. So the outreach program is working with the impacted family for, for the duration that they are uh, in our program. And if there is need for extra supports after this, they continue to work with them. Uh, so at least one year, and it's it's based on it's client driven, right? So the program is offered to them, so they are not obligated to accept the services. Uh, but at least they do the safety checks and they talk about resources. Um, and again, it's it's really based on safety. They talk a little bit about, they talk a lot actually about the psychoeducation piece, so understanding abuse, the safety, um, safety planning as well, which is critical for them and for the family, for the children, um, the whole case management portion. And people who have been to the program, both the safe at home and outreach, and other programs within within Rowan House, uh, important to say that they they can come back. If something happens in future, we have our doors open. Uh, so that it doesn't mean that it happens all the time, but definitely is something that they can turn to um, to again whenever they need. Excellent. Um, and then Knut Peterson, in your work, do you try hard to get grandparents and other family members involved uh it's it's we look more the services that are provided are more for the immediate family when we are working with the impacted family and with the individual perpetrating abuse we can definitely offer resources in community that can support those impacted by by that as well the extended family i mean Excellent. That was it for the questions. So I want to thank you very much on behalf of SACPA for your time and for this wonderful presentation. Again, it's so wonderful to, to actually see a program that deals with the issue. Um, before we uh, wrap up this session, do you have a take home message for our viewer? Thank, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm, I'm so happy that we are having this conversation, that we are opening the door. Uh, and so, so grateful for all the questions and the participation of this amazing group. So uh, I, I feel honored really for this opportunity. I think uh, the message that I will leave is it's really, let's talk about this. Let's normalize the conversation and let's, Let's be gentle to each other. If if somebody is is out there is hurting, uh, let let's talk about there is resources available. We are here to support. And if this is not the right support for you, there is right supports available out there. So if you're not sure, give us a call. We are happy to support you for this journey. And stay safe. <laughs> Excellent. 
and uh, I'm just going to pop up the PowerPoint with the contact information again. And uh, while that is up, I will let everybody know that next week we have Not Alone, Men Experiences of Domestic Abuse with Stefan de Villeur. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that next week. And thank you very much for tuning in and um, see you next week.